Now, as we pivot over into the global market, I just wanted to stop for a moment and talk about, you know, the the, the trading range that we've discussed. And and I had somebody asking me uh, that they'd like me to go through it again. So I, I figured it would it would make sense, especially given what Saudi has done, as you can see with some of the OSP numbers that are showing on the screen at the moment. You can get an idea that there is an underlying problem with demand. I mean, you, when you look at some of the problems that we've seen, that we've talked about, uh, and, and again, not that there's a huge issue with demand because it, it's gone up. It's gone up below seasonal norms, but still moved with seasonal trends. You know, the question is always supply side. So the supply, it's, it's, it was reduced. That's putting in the floor. So the floor is, look, I, I don't care how bad the recession is. The recession has to get much, much worse at this point. That that reduction, especially as Saudi has increased it or, or has maintained it a million barrels in July, a million barrels in August, that is going to put the floor in. That is where we get that 72, 73 on the downside. The upside is gonna is what's capped by the demand front. Because when you look at demand, you have demand dropping off, you have people that can't afford it, and you just have that, that squeeze that happens the higher you go. Now, the dollar is going to stay a bit stronger. You know, we're likely to get at least another quarter point increase in, uh, in, in 2023. You know, the Fed's likely to do that quarter point increase in July. And that's, again, you're going to see that pressure point, though, that's squeezing back down. And that's where we get this cap, where we just don't really see mu much reason to break above it, given the pressure points. You know, if we went back to 85, 90, inflation would take back off. You'd see more rate hikes. You'd see more pressure at the pump. You'd see more pressure for the consumer. And that's where we get this band. And realistically, OPEC wants 75, 76, or we should say Saudi wants 75, 76. That's the range. And they're going to do what they can to protect that floor. What we see happening is, and again, with the, with the additional cut in August, kind of helps bridge that gap. We saw August where you were going to actually start to see that floor give way a bit. And instead of it being 72 to 78, 77, or if you want to tighten it, 73 to 78 with those extensions of 72 to 78, we saw that kind of dipping down and going 76, 68. But now, you know, August kind of gets picked back up. You get back in that range. But then as you go into the shoulder season, we still see some of that downside. But again, it's not like we're going to get this collapse to the 50s. You know, Saudi has made sure of that. But we're not getting this huge bump and they're losing money. I mean, they're not selling a million barrels a day in July and in August. You know, there's only so much that they can do. And, and by losing money, because, you know, if you look, what the prices are still here. It's not like they cut a million barrels and prices went up 10 bucks. So they're losing money, but some of that has to bleed back. And typically, you know, August is when you start to see, or I should say end of July into August, you start to see China starting to increase their buying, which is why we thought that they were going to, uh, you know, instead of having a million barrels in July, a million barrels in August, it would be 500 in August because they were going to bring back uh, some of that additional crude as China started to increase their buying again. Obviously, they didn't, and, and as we talked about in segment one, there's a lot of crude that's still sitting on the water, and we're going to talk more about that in this segment. That's going to be some of that overarching problems that we continue to talk about. Now, uh, outside of Superlight, uh, which, they, which they took down slightly into Asia, which is still very expensive, you know, they took up pricing in light, medium, heavy, going into Asia. Into the med, they took everything up at least 95 cents, up to a dollar. Into the U.S., everything got moved up by 10 cents. And into Europe, everything went up by 80 cents. So again, you're seeing this pressure point because, and we'll show you some of the, the pictures just so you get an idea of just where that is in relation to historics. It's expensive, and, and it's gotten insanely <laughs> just stupid expensive going to the U.S. Like at this point, they might as well not even post it because it's so absurd that unless you have a term contract, nobody is buying that crude from, uh, at least in the U.S., from Saudi. Like it just doesn't make sense. You'd buy it from Iraq. You know, you'd buy it from Nigeria. You, you'd, you'd try to blend some sort of piece just because the numbers don't make sense when you think about the shipping coming in. 
Now, the UAE kind of threw a little bit of a jab. They will not voluntarily uh, cut, uh, they, they will not join voluntary oil cuts at the present time. You know, the UAE is doing enough to contribute to the OPEC plus production cuts and won't be making further voluntary supply reductions at the present time. Voluntary cuts by other group members are sufficient to balance the market. OPEC plus may need to invite newcomers to join the group as the group's job becomes easier with more members. And so again, they're essentially just saying, this is all you. If you want to do it, you do it. They, in return for allowing some of these uh, adjustments, because you, the UAE did cut some production along the OPEC plus agreement, and but in return they can they could increase their quota. Now there's been rumors bouncing around of Kuwait wanting their quota increased, then they came out and denied it. The all of these nations have been focusing on increasing their production for the last ten years, so. The UAE got very adamant about that in 21, uh, in the summer of 21, and Kuwait's going to do it the same thing. They they bringing on production. They're going to want their pound of flesh as well. It, it won't be as sizable as the UAE, but there still will be that movement higher, and that's going to be a geopolitical, uh, I should say, an OPEC, a very big OPEC negotiation. Now, I'm, I'm sure you also heard, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> I'm sure you've also heard how Russia has been uh, has said that they they're they're super serious this time. They're absolutely going to cut produ- uh, production. They're absolutely going to cut exports. <laughs> so, so then, well, let's look at exports. So, Russia's seaborne crude shipments, uh, the seaborne crude exports. You can see there there. This is I think the third highest week. Uh, ending July 2nd, this is the third highest week they've had uh, uh, essentially throughout the, the the year of 2023, which is, well, if you go back, the highest it's ever been. So this is the third highest it's ever been. So again, oh, <laughs> you, it, they say one thing and it sounds great, but then what are they actually doing? And so they're trying to balance, and, and, and I'll repeat it again just because I think it's a very important point. Russia has very finite storage because they have a ton of pipeline networks and they've always used pipelines. So why have all this, this, this storage when I just need some, some buffer between pipelines? So they would pipe a lot of uh, refined product. They would pipe a lot of crude. That is an, a large part of that is now shut down. So they have to move it other ways. So that's how they, they put it on the water. So could they reduce their their crude exports? Absolutely. But typically when they're reducing their crude exports, it's because they're increasing their refined products. They are going to need to balance this. So could they bring this back down in line with what they said for a couple of weeks? Yes, but you have to look at how much distillate are they exporting? How much gasoline are they exporting? Because it seems as though they'll, they whenever they reduce their, their, uh, their crude exports, you know, they actually double their their product exports, or at least you know, are are barrel for barrel on the replacement, which still just changes kind of where that oversupply looks and becomes a much bigger issue. And it's no surprise that it, uh, it's ninety nine percent of it is going to Asia. So as it goes to Asia, again, that puts more pressure in terms of what is Saudi looking at, and they've decided we don't want to compete with Russia in this market. And who says they have to compete with it just to be competitive? Like, don't even worry about competing it, just being competitive because at, at this at this pricing juncture, there's no reason to come out and, and try to compete. Now, CPC had or Kazakhstan had a power outage that caused our production to fall about 12 percent. That has now been rectified. And then when you look at what some of the OSPs are doing, Nigeria has set the official selling price at a two cent discount to uh, dated Brent, which is an increase from from negative 39 cents in June. But remember, this is just kind of a guidance. You know, typically it moves around a bit. Forcado's OSP cut to dated Brent of of 17 cents versus what it was at 21 uh, at 21 cents, which is the weakest since November 2021. So there's, there's, you have to look at what is the competition. Nigeria has the opportunity to take advantage of some of the strength uh, from Saudi, you know, try to get some of these barrels through, try to get some of this West African uh, barrels into the market. So when you look at India, well, India is similar to China. They're sitting there and saying, well, uh, we're going to take advantage of this as well. June marked the 10th consecutive monthly rise in India's Russia imports. 
Uh, we don't see that changing. Again, they're they're facing the inflation issues. They're facing the the slowdowns just like everyone else. India's out happens to be the better of of the others. So again, they're just going to import more Russia. But by doing that, you're leaving Saudi crude in the water. You're leaving Iraqi crude in the water. And so instead of Saudi Arabia saying, well, we'll leave it in there. Well, no, we're going to take it out. We'll just take that crude out. We don't want to let it sit. We'll leave it in the ground. And then Iraq, which has seen some of this come down. Now, that is a benefit for the U.S. because th those are barrels that we do very well with, especially on the Basra heavy, Basra medium which we'll pay a premium for at this point, just given how short we are on the heavy and the medium sour side. Then when you look at just putting into perspective some of these uh, Saudi cuts, uh, Saudi OSP increases, this is light crude heading into Asia. You can see the only time that that OSP was higher was in 2022. And you can see, again, trending up. Now, they normally do get some price increases, but this is extensive, and this is why you, when you look at saw at at, uh, at Asia, they're like, look, there's no point in buying Saudi. We'll buy other things. You know, this again made the U.S. competitive once again, and and not a hugely competitive because you still have rates that are elevated from a tanker side. Uh, we had uh, we had two failed attempts of Iran trying to uh, capture two uh, tanks, uh, you know, uh, crew tankers. The U.S. military was able to to deflect it. And again, these are things where just little nuances that continue to happen within the market, keeping some of that those uh, those day rates a bit higher and that insurance expensive. <laughs> this is Middle East Arab light crude uh, heading into uh, into into Europe. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, to give you an idea uh, that it is, uh, it's not that good, and there's really no reason for anybody to actually uh, to actually buy it when you look at what is heading into the med, uh, the Mediterranean, and then when you look at what's coming to the U.S., <laughs> you get an idea. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's just what the prices are. You're like, so no, I, I won't pay that. So, <laughs> but again, it just gives you an idea of just where prices have been in the past, where they are now. But at the same time, when you look at this, well, it's like, well, how much crude is sitting in floating storage? So Middle East floating crude has come back down, but you're still at a bit of an elevated level. You know, we're right where we were in 2021, and this is going to be something that they want to see continue to come down. But remember, there was that uh, a large amount of ships that were sitting in the Red Sea, and a lot of that was, again, uh, just refilling a lot of the storage within Egypt, which is where uh, Saudi was trying to get some of this off the water, put it into onshore tanks. And that's, I think, what we're seeing right now. A lot of this crude is getting pushed into onshore tanks, and then Saudi's keeping their production low to keep that floating storage number down while they continue to refill some of that and take advantage of some of that offshore, uh, that onshore storage. Western Canadian, uh, Canadian Select Differential Index. Here you can see that it continues to strengthen. The only time it was higher was in 2017 and 2020 uh, over the last 10 years. And again, look at 2023 and how we've had that nice steady lockstep increase. Excuse me, and a lot of that is because we need heavy crude and we don't have the crude that we need, which is why we continue to see this crude getting pulled down. Pad two is going to continue to import. Pad three is going to pull down whatever it can, and and that again, that's going to keep that WCS very tight because we will pay a premium. It's still ten dollars below, but that's the cost of shipping. You know, it's anywhere between eight and twelve dollars. So essentially, we're sitting there saying, look, we'll pay. We'll, we'll even give you some some additional netbacks because we need this in a big way. And that becomes a much bigger uh, a much bigger focal point as the U.S. tries to close that gap on the quality front. Now, as we were talking about you know, WCS and, and all of that heavier crude, it really comes down to when, you, especially when you start looking at the naphtha crack versus the fuel oil crack spread. So, naphtha or condensate, depending on the nomenclature. You know, the U.S. produces a lot of condensate. It produces a lot of naphtha, and that is a really key piece that goes into the petrochemical side but typically there's a value behind it it can go into the gasoline stream as some as of uh, as you know created into octane or it goes into pet chem <clears throat> but light sweet crude produces a lot of naphtha or comes along with a lot of naphtha where the fuel oil side you know especially the the 30 uh 380 cst which is you know the heavy junky stuff is actually trading at a premium so you're sitting here and it's like well 
I can make naphtha, but I can't make that, especially given based on the crude grades that are available, which is why people are looking to go heavier and heavier. And this is, we've seen crack spread, we've seen uh, ref, um, petrochemical facilities start shuttering, you know, start reducing run rates. And a lot of this is driven by a lot of these different pieces, which again is, is the problem that continues to play out. And then as you see people, you know, especially countries, looking to purchase more and more fuel oil to help backstop some of their, uh, their power systems, that's also going to put a bit more of a pricing floor on some of this while naphtha continues to get flooded into the market. So then when you look at the U.S., you know, you've seen some of that four-week rolling average dip a bit. Again, we think it, it drifts a little bit lower, but we're not going much below 3.7 million barrels a day just because... Look at the Saudi OSPs. You know, it's not like they they made uh, heavy very expensive and light super cheap. They made it all expensive. So we're still competitive when you compare it, which is why we're still going to go to Europe. We're still going to get some comp- uh, some ability to go into uh, into Asia, especially South Korea and Japan. But and the, but then when you start looking at the crack spreads, so one of the things that we had said was that we were going to go from ten you know, to, to 20, uh, I'm sorry, more like 13 to 20 quickly. And then we thought we were going to then break back through 13 and closer to 10. Instead, we were, we're just bouncing around here. And our view is that you're going to get a export you know, increase coming from China into the Asian market, uh, Asian market, which would then, you know, push these spreads lower. Now, and then that would that would force the Asian refiners to ramp down, reduce run rates. <clears throat> but instead, the, the margin is still there, and we're still uh, in, in this point where China is still absorbing a lot of this. A lot of it's going into storage. So you're still seeing this balancing act. Our fear, just like <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing with, um, with uh, steel, is that the, the Chinese could just essentially dump all of this all at once. And it's going to be a very interesting one to watch and something to keep track of when we look at some of the underlying uh, structures. And one of the, the key structures that we're seeing, and we'll talk about it in, in, a, in a little bit, are some of the new um, uh, fees that have to be paid, which are, are going to be very important when we start looking at, okay, well, if they have to pay fees internally, does it make sense to increase exports, which again could push this down. Then you start looking at the Dubai, uh, uh, the Dubai Brent swap, and it's still, uh, you know, things are, are still upside down when you look at these different swaps, which is why you're seeing some additional view on Brent. You know, Murbane should be able to benefit from some of this just because it is free floating to a point. But the UAE is sitting here saying, look, guys, we're not cutting anymore. We're already sitting here. And we're more expensive than Brent, which shouldn't happen. So again, they're, they're, they're looking to manage this as best they can, which is why they're going to maintain their current levels. Asian floating storage has come back to what we were saying it was going to be between that 20, you know, 2022, 2021 level. But as additional volume shows up, you're, we actually expect this to start to creep higher because they're importing at a much higher level than they really have before, obviously outside of 2020. So here, when you look at it, there's actually been a big increase, which is a bit counter seasonal for what it normally happens. That sometimes they have a, a a mid, an early July spike, but when you look at the previous years, then it starts to really slow down, <clears throat> and we really haven't had a meaningful slowdown because. There's a lot of opportunity for China to take advantage of some of these discounted crudes. China's fuel export margins uh, could face some pressure. So the fuel export margins could come under renewed pressure if domestic prices continue rising after the imposition of new consumption taxes. So now it's like, okay, well, do I export it or do I stay, keep it local, kind of wait for what this looks like on a margin basis? And it might make sense to try to sell more internally, but you know, what about, what does that do to the consumer? Because it's going to increase the cost of gasoline and diesel blending, driving domestic prices higher. So China wants to increase demand. They want to increase activity, but they're going to increase prices. So again, like you get an idea of how, I, I don't know how they're going to think through this because at one side they want dual circulation strategy, common, uh, you know, uh, common prosperity, but yet you're going to raise prices for people. 
And again, that's why I think you have some refiners that are like, look, we're going to take a step back. We're going to continue to, we're, we're going to reduce runs, which they have. We're going to fill up storage. And if the timing's right and they say, look, we, we can't impact people this way, they'll dump it into the market or they'll sell it here. And then that will, again, essentially eliminate any need for imports of refined products. And you'll see a little bit of a balancing act in general, but that's going to be an interesting one to play out. Especially because, again, you, as we've said was going to happen, the Chinese activity is marrying 2022. You had the Dragon Boat Festival. You had a nice little increase. And now you're, you're kind of bouncing around. There was lockdowns that, that came into the end of the, this period of China. So 2023 will be better than 2022. But again, as you're seeing, not by this huge surge in numbers, just based on there's no lockdowns, things are going to stay at this activity level and then start to drift a bit lower as along those seasonal fronts. West Africa had a, uh, so some of this got re-rated. So West Africa crude oil floating storage got to moved up a bit. So again, it, it's coming down. You're seeing more sales coming from West Africa and it's because all of that heavier crude is getting moved into the system. People will take what they can. And realistically, some of this should continue to come into the Atlantic Basin. So when you look at crude exports or, uh, you know, crude and product exports from the U.S., uh, gasoline had a small decline of 4,000 barrels a day, still well over the five-year average. Uh, Distillate had a drop of 195,000 barrels a day, still 23,000 over the five-year uh, then you look at propane. Propylene had a big drop of 645,000, but that's still above the five-year average, which is going to stay strong. And then you had some lumpiness in crude oil exports, which again is just kind of bouncing around. So then when you when you break it into its pieces, we want to look at gasoline. So our view is that gasoline trends towards the five-year average, but because there's some opportunity between getting it for, into the Atlantic Basin, trying to, to maneuver it into Latin America, into some of these other areas. But when you look at Pemex, they're talking about exporting more distillate when, and, and some additional gasoline. So it's, we think there's going to be pressure. But it, again, it's not that it's going to collapse it. It's just going to move it closer to that five-year. Then when you look at distillate, distillate is, uh, is, is tracking the five-year average. You know, this is where we think this could trend a bit lower. And again, just stay below the five-year average, kind of walking at that, at the higher end of the cloud, but again, just still below that five-year. All the while, when you look at, uh, at crude oil exports, again, being lumpy, still staying fairly strong as propane, propylene is, is going to pri remain price appropriate given the level of storage we have in the U.S. and the level of demand abroad, you know, as Saudi takes down their exp uh, their production as Kazakhstan struggles with some of their production. The U.S. is the natural fit to replace some of this flow, which is why we do see propane and propylene and, again, LPG in general continuing to be flow. Uh, flow. Same with ethane as a lot of that ethane because typically if you have an ethane cracker, 87% of that ethane cracker has to be ethane. So if you build that cracker, you're building uh, essentially a built-in component. Obviously, ethane is much cheaper than everything else, but you're beholden to it. So even though you, we're getting some additional flow, you still have to pull this. And because the U.S. has that sizable amount of storage, that is enabling, a, again, more of, us, uh, more of this to be exported into the market. Now, when we turn to global uh, levels uh, in Fujara, we're still over 20 million barrels in storage. We're at 20.189 after a drop of 488,000. Uh, stock movement saw a drop in light distillate with a rise in middle and heavy. Light distillate decreased 867,000 barrels. East of Suez gasoline complex strengthened in early trade uh, amid uh, just amid some U.S. summer driving season. Total U.S. gasoline stocks also rose by 603,000 on, uh, on the week. To, so again, it's kind of a, an adjustment in general. Moving forward, uh, peop, uh, participants expect U.S. gasoline demand to taper off towards the end of driving season in September, which is very normal. It's just a matter of what happens now. So Indonesia gasoline imports rose along the Eid holiday, but that is starting to drift lower. So realistically, you're getting some of this movement, but we do expect a bit of a bounce back to 7 million in storage, especially as you have some of that underlying slowdown. Middle distillate uh, rose 65,000 barrels. The east of Suez gas oil market was largely flattish. 
Uh, industry uh, sources weighed an anticipated uptick in China's gas oil exports in July against stable regional demand. The question is always going to be what happens with some of that blending, what happens with local uh, numbers. So they see exports from China amid estimates of around 800,000 to 900,000 metric tons of outflow, uh, or at least 30% higher than June, which is likely because, again, they have a lot of storage, which is what we continue to see in terms of that balancing act. But I think they want more clarity on, well, what can I sell for, sell it internally? So that's going to that's going to uh, change things. Physical gas oil trades were uh, last low. Uh, trades were last lower in December 2022. Trade sources said the decline in volumes came on the back of unviable east-west arbitrage, which trapped surplus barrels in the region. Toward the end of June, uh, east-west arbitrage lanes were marginally open, with inquiries streaming in from Europe and South Africa. So again, that's where we're going to see some of those flows. But in the meantime. We should see a little bit more builds as they that China kind of figures out. There could be a little bit of a timing gap, but we do see this being a bit higher, which is, but again, 3.559 million is still at a very, <laughs> still at a high, it's still at a low end. So we're not talking about this huge surge. Heavy resid rose 314,000 barrels. Spot training activity at the, at the uh, hub in Singapore and Fujara was ranging below average to moderate at best during the first trading days of the week amid adequate low sulfur fuel cargoes and just, again, slower demand just based on slowing activity in uh, shipping. Time spreads had a sharp recovery following uh, the commentary from uh, Saudi, which, again, you could see it's still, it's it just moved back into contango. It's still at the lower end, but, again, it's, I'm sorry, backwardation, but you're still seeing some of this in general. And then now that Brent is cheaper than UAE, again, this continues to kind of shift some of those different movements around. Now when we look at flows, uh, Angola took down some of their exports in, in August as you have Nigeria that increased it. Uh, Nigeria wants to move their production to be a continuous 1.5 to 1.6 million barrels a day. Norway something uh, is, remains at about 1.7. As, as we see, uh, we have Russia continuing to be at about 4.8. Uh, the issue right now is Libya. So there's been uh, back and forth in terms of more threats of uh, blockades. It'll be something to watch because if they take enough, if they take the million barrels a day out of the market, that'll tighten things very quickly. So that could be a bigger spike, which I think is going to be an important one to watch um, in general. And then when uh, just when we look at some of the different flows, CPC now trades at a disc at discounts of about a dollar seventy to two dollar dated Brent, which is about forty to seventy cents higher than a week ago. And so you're starting to see some tightness, but again, we're still not back to where we were. Uh, in in Europe, you've you've had some draws. You can see draws usually start around now. This one is a little bit earlier. But you can see, again, kind of right in line with where things have been in the past. Uh, when you look at gas oil, there was a sizable uh, decline, another sizable decline in, um, in storage. You know, when we look at some of the storage levels in internal, again, just trying to uh, give you the exact numbers. So when we look at, at where things were, you know, we had gas oil that declined by 35 last week and then this week. You had a decline of 50. So again, that kind of steady decline that continues. Uh, gasoline had another build because, of course, it did because <laughs> it's essentially endless in terms of some of the builds. But that's the because the gas oil has moved down. It's why you're starting to see some of that arbitrage open back up between east west, west east, and that's going to be an important kind of draw. And the question is, how much of that Middle East can take some of this market share? Because the U.S. is does isn't really in a position at this point to be competitive on a pricing metric. Gasoline again blown back to the highs, highest uh, of all time, seasonally adjusted. Again, this is why we continue to see those flows coming from Europe into the U.S., which is as we talked about in segment two, going to keep a very continuous flow. Fuel oil, on the other hand, is at 2023 highs. Uh, it's going to come down, do they recrack it? What do they do with it? Because they're going to need to create other things. And this could allow them for some blending in Europe, which is why you might see some of those European imports, you know, slow down, especially given where some of those cracks, uh, those OSPs have gone. When we look at Singapore, uh, it's just below the 20, uh, the, uh, 17 year average, you know, as a total, we think it's going to trend, you know, right around that level. 
When we look at uh, light distillate, you had a nice drop. A lot of this was seasonal. Uh, typically, you get a drop. You know, this one happened a little bit later because we were starting so much higher. And this was because of Eid, because of the Dragon Boat Festival. This will come back up, and we think it'll come back to where we were again in 22 and 2020. Not really breaking to new highs, but staying at the very high end of that, uh, of that realm. As middle distillate continues to be at the low end, this is where we continue to see that support for crack spreads. And until China kind of makes that decision, this is going to stay on the lower end, and this is going to uh, promote additional uh, runs, or at least normal runs, seasonal runs, for the other Asian refiners. As a resid kind of just hangs around uh, that 17 average, which we think is going to be stable. Uh, North Sea continues to trend up on the floating storage side. It's still at the low end, but again, we're, we're having that drift up, and that's all. a lot of that is based on just you know, people kind of waiting for prices to, uh, to, to flesh out and as well as some timing delay. And then when we look at Europe, you had that nice little spike, which is why when you look at our European onshore, you're going to get a little bit of a balancing act, which is why we think that things are going to flatline a bit onshore as some of this normalizes and, and European activity continues to be on the downward trajectory, especially given some of the most recent economic data, which we're going to talk about next week. So if you have any questions, please let us know. You know we'd love to hear from you if you want me to cover anything in, uh, specifically. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network.